Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Robin Niblett, um, chairing this, what they call afternoon session, but it's before lunch, so I'm not quite <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. It's 10 past 12, okay, that's it, it's afternoon. Uh, I thought Mediterranean afternoon started at about four o'clock, but uh, we're, we're happy to start with, uh, with one now. Um, this is a, uh, a conversation, which is why we've insisted on having ourselves seated here a little bit uh, in front of you and uh, taking the opportunity to, uh, we have one hour here now before lunch, and the topic we've been given is a suitably broad and wide one in challenges and funding opportunities. So that's given us a lot of scope, uh, perhaps to uh, explore some of the uh, challenges facing foundations right now, not just at this moment, as we say here, of economic crisis, but I, I think, uh, having spoken a little bit to my two panelists yesterday evening, I think we'll also be uh, considering the question whether we've entered some type of new normal for uh, certainly countries and parts of Europe, perhaps the United States, many of the countries that we've been discussing uh, in the first day and a half of this conference, that yes, we're in the middle of a crisis, but the fact is there are at least two factors which go beyond the crisis and which are likely to affect the context in which all foundations will operate. One is the ongoing process of globalization, economic change, uh, the extent to which countries in particular in the West, which took greatest advantage of globalization for over 100 years, 150 years, are now having to adapt. Uh, and secondly, how governments, companies, uh, and other parts of society are reacting to these changes and what this means for foundations. Because I think our suspicion is, having talked about this, is we are in a different world. And even if we get out, and hopefully we will get out of this crisis, certainly in Europe, uh, in the next year or two, um, that the context in which foundations have to operate, their relationships with society, with governments, have probably changed quite fundamentally. Uh, and we want to be able to touch on that topic. I think that Ingrid Schillerand did us a great favor by posing the question she did. We could have almost asked her to ask that question uh, before our panel, because I think we wanted to tackle this loss of trust that may be emerging right now between public uh, and private sectors in the wake of the crisis, and a loss of trust that may be very hard to regain. So these are the kind of topics we want to be able to tackle today. We have, in Marcus Hipp and Pierre Mario Velo, two people, I think, particularly uh, well-placed to, to tackle these questions. Marcus, uh, as you all know, he is executive director of the BMW Foundation, the Quant uh, Stiftung uh, in Germany. Um, he's been a long time worker within the foundation world in Germany, which happens to have a very developed foundation uh, sector, uh, having worked also in the Robert Bosch uh, Stiftung uh, prior to his position, his leadership position uh, at BMW. And in Pierre Mario Velo, you've got all their bios there, uh, but we have the secretary general of the Cariplo Foundation, uh, again, somebody who brings extensive experience, but in his case, also in the private sector, uh, where he has worked in senior management positions, looking at quality management, uh, human resources, strategic planning, and has written, written extensively on this concept of a learning organization, as he calls it. So I think uh, we're going to have a conversation right now about these challenges. Let me start, Marcus, with you. Um, what is changing? I mean, uh, surely we're in a situation right now where uh, countries in the West, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Western Europe, the United States, are facing a profoundly different environment in which they can achieve social welfare, and welfare for their citizens. What do you think has changed most fundamentally? What examples do you have of change as you see it from your experience? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I really want to congratulate the Foundation and the EFC doing this conference in this time in, in uh, Athens when I got the invitation. You think always about Doing that, I, I no moment regret it. I was so inspired the last two days, and congratulations to this great program of speakers you have. And that's exactly, I think, what you need, this kind of convenience in times of change. Let me perhaps, uh, I, I changed my agenda completely, so you can read my position paper. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think, uh, I take this question of change and transformation. Uh, and I would like to tell very shortly three stories about which, out of my experience, which I was very close to, uh, and it's nothing about Greece, but three stories about change, and perhaps it has something to do with Greece. Well, let's see <laughs> on that. So the first story is, I would call it uh, uh, the story about why was Poland so successful and Ukraine not uh, in the last 20 years. This is, uh, and uh, 
I was working for the Bosch Foundation. First, I was a fellow in the, in the 1990s uh, of the Bosch Foundation. I wrote my master's about Václav Havel, which was an inspiring person for me. And I lived in Czech Republic. I spent a lot of time in Central Eastern Europe. And I worked then for the Bosch Foundation in Central Europe in the civil society and foundation sector. What I've learned out of that time, why, why was Poland successful and Ukraine perhaps not in transforming a society? My result after looking back in this time is very easy. It was a, a parallel process in Poland of a, of a, of a top-down approach, which was the key. They wanted to join the union and they had to change really hard the political framework, the economic framework, and that was very pressureful, very hard, but very necessary. On the other side, it was bottom-up. You had a growing, in, incredible growing uh, uh, and starting uh, civil society landscape, which was supported from foundations around the world, but also just coming out of like, like, in, a, like in, a, uh, in a gardening house. And it was great to see that. And these both movements came together and I think have been the real reason why Poland is nowadays one of the most performing uh, countries in the European Union. You can take Estonia, you can take other countries. And I think that's perhaps my first point. It's really about transforming always also the, the whole political framework and, and you have to build up a an, an, an lively and innovative kind of business sector and a lot of opportunities there have been. So this is the first st story why Poland was successful, Ukraine or not. You had also, we had also programs in Ukraine, a lot of civil society, but as long as the framework does not change, it's really difficult. And we had some discussions, I remember, with, a, with an Ukrainian guy in the 1990s who said, be careful, your foundations are so sexy for the most talented people, but you attract them and the idiots go to the politics and, yeah. and, and do the mafia jobs and stuff like that. So it can be very controversial. We have to be much more careful in frameworks working where you don't have the political change. That's the first point of changing and transformation. The second is, which uh, I just want to continue, some of the speakers I've heard, already heard about Philadelphia and New York and cities, how to change cities. And I think this is a great topic to speak in the mother of cities in Athens. I studied uh, ancient Greek as a student. And uh, of course, I learned that this is the mother, ma the mother of cities and what is the idea of cities. I would like to tell the story of Berlin the last 20 years, also very shortly, if you allow. Berlin, I think, had to do a transformation and that sounds perhaps now, it should not sound comparing something, but I think the transformation of Berlin the last 20 years was, was much harder and the challenge this city had to face is really much harder still than that what you have in the moment in Athens. Just some numbers. It was a completely external funded city in the West and in the East in the 80s, yes? It was the front city of the communists and it was the front city of the capitalists and they put a lot of money to just to keep people and business and all there. It was over bureaucratic, it was amazing. And then the wall broke down and inside of two years Berlin completely lost 90% of, of its industrial basis. It was really a desert in the beginning of the 90s and it was depressing and it was really hard. But then what happened? There came a first wave of young people which left Berlin again frustrated because it was still not a kind of atmosphere to start something new. It was too depressing in the beginning. But then, and uh, I'm not a friend of him, the mayor of Berlin, uh, Klaus Wolverheide, but then he made in a speech because a lot of people attacked him that he is more on parties than really hardworking for, for the city. He made a, a claim which really changed the atmosphere. And uh, that was, Berlin is poor, but sexy, yeah? <laughs> and that was something which went around Europe and the whole world. And the second wave of people coming, beginning from the end of the 90s in the last 10 years, was amazing. Do you know how many people fly in every Friday just to have party in Berlin with EasyJet and trains? More than 20,000. And it's li live all the time. Do you know where all the artists go? Because they find, and that's the topic we have heard from Philadelphia, there is empty space, there is cheap space, and there is an atmosphere where people just can try things new. And that was the second wave which came in. And if you look now, how Berlin is transforming, and people coming all over, from, from, it, it got very international. Half of the population of this 3.5 million city has been changed in the last 20 years. The half of the population. I think there is no city 
uh, in, the, in the world in the last, perhaps Shanghai, because it just grew, <laughs> or Mumbai, or this, in, in these countries, or Istanbul. But in Europe, you will never find, and I think you can learn a lot of that, and if the mayor would still be here, I would invite him to come to Berlin and to bring him together with the people which created this atmosphere, and, mm -hmm. uh, and let that space. So the, the first rule would be, these people which coming and want to start something new, just let them. It's a very, very invisible framework, uh, perhaps some fire stuff in the, in the fabric halls, but not more. They just want to be free, and then they start I incredible things. So this could be the second story, and the third story, it's about us, the foundations you already mentioned. That was also a kind of transformation, and we heard much about that. Germany has a, a very strong uh, uh, foundation landscape. We have 19,000 independent foundations, <laughs> more than tw uh, uh, 12,000 out of them the last 20 years. And we did a lot of mistakes also in our sector, just very short. In the 90s, the foundation came into the game, and we had a little bit of an over-bureaucratic state, and so and the foundation came with an attitude, let's show them how to do it. We develop and push a lot of money and stuff, and then we make pilots and programs, and then in that way we will change the state. That was, a, I think, a big mistake. And what happened the last 10 years, there came really two completely new tools in. The one was really a kind of of catalytic approach, which we heard much about that, about really what does it mean to develop innovation together, cross-sectoral together, and we have heard a lot of examples how that works from the US and also from, from other foundations in, in Portugal. It's really not building parallel system, mm -hmm. it's, it's thinking about how we could with this little money as privates we have to influence and to find the best instruments to change the whole system and to innovate the system, not to change but to innovate the system. And the other one is, uh, is really inside of the civil society and foundation community it was the tool of venture philanthropy, which was focusing much more on, on really building stable infrastructure, new financial models, much more sustainable models of, of um, organization for the sector, which are not completely de dependent, coming out of the paternalism between giving grant giving foundations, looking down on NGOs as cheap services, mm -hmm. really to come on, on one level and to help, and we have heard about this, a lot of examples, in capacity building and really also perhaps, and that's venture philanthropy then at its best, looking, is there a possibility to not being completely dependent from public and private uh, grant money as a foundation, uh, as an NGO, but also perhaps develop a kind of entrepreneurial kind of philanthropy, which we have heard uh, yesterday from one of the speakers, which I was very impressed. This is things of change which I have seen, and uh, perhaps it has something to do with Greek, I don't know. Well, no. I think the, the example, especially in your first one, that may come back to Greece or not, you gave the example of Poland and Ukraine, Poland with the European acquis, with, with, a, with a drive to be able to meet certain regulations that have already been established for it, that top-down structure. Now, of course, countries like Italy, Greece, Spain, Portugal were already inside the EU and have had some difficulty making that adjustment. So, um, you know, I think it'll be worth exploring whether, as you said, the bottom-up factor interacts effectively with the top-down right. to be able to create that, that, uh, that structure. And let me come, Pierre Mario, to you right now, especially uh, this example was given of, of top-down versus uh, bottom-up change. How do you think, uh, from your perspective, sitting inside the Kariplov Foundation, really the world has changed. What is the context in which you're having to operate? What is the role that government is playing, that the private sector is playing, and where do foundations fit within this? Thank you, Robin. Uh, I have to just uh, have a in small introduction because um, <clears throat> I am a bit uh, uh, embarrassed because I think that I am a bit uh, masochist because I always decide to attend a meeting like this one because uh, at the end of the meeting I have so many things to improve at home <laughs> that I am, uh, I feel a bit frustrated. <laughs> and um, um, I'm, I thank you because, uh, because you decided to put ourselves uh, in, on the chair here and not on the table <clears throat> because I don't uh, have uh, many answers. I have more questions than answers. But, uh, so I'm not so uh, safe on my thinking, but uh, I would like just a reasoning with you. And I uh, thanks, of course, uh, to uh, Niarka's Foundation <clears throat> for inviting me. Uh, yes, you have said the, the world is changing. Uh, 
Um, and uh, we, I, I take a bit of distance, uh, and I want, I would like to to see the things uh, uh, at at a distance. <clears throat> and I have to say that uh, uh, first of all, we have to understand uh, uh, why we are together, why we decide to live in a society, why we decide to live in a group. Uh, I think that. Uh, the decision, you know, Aristotle said, uh, human being is a, a, a zone politicon. But uh, I think that when you decide to be together in a society, you make uh, an ethical choice. Hmm? So the ethos is another Greek word. Ethos means domus in Latin, house, better, home. It's a space where you build something together for a common good. And so, in this sense, uh, when we are talking about uh, state, about economics, uh, and about philanthropy, we have always to remember that we are in an ethical field. Uh, it doesn't um, have anything to do with uh, uh, sin, religion, uh, um, spirituality, moral, it's totally different. It's uh, how we create a common home with the common good. This is the, the, the main thing. My opinion, it's my personal opinion, is that uh, if we see the, um, the political point, uh, po uh, political sector, we have uh, a lot of failures because we have, for example, in, uh, first of all, the difficulty to create uh, a European uh, unity today, uh, because there are many controversies, uh, many many debates. Uh, uh, the the process is very <clears throat> slow, and there were they they have been uh, many mistakes at the beginning because they created the euro, but they didn't create the political union. <clears throat> Um, the politicians have also the task of governing the justice and the equality among the people. And um, the politician used as a tool the welfare. And the welfare is, was the invention after the Second World War and was the, a big inven invention, was a bigger task, uh, a bigger success. Uh, and they used the, the welfare to balance uh, the wealth uh, among the people, to give the people the same opportunities, uh, because they don't want, uh, the states uh, generally don't want to have uh, sex of poverty inside the society, otherwise it creates uh, tension. And then they use, they use welfare. But the management of welfare is not a gift, it's a redistribution. Mm -hmm. So if I am a politician, I take from taxes the money and I redistribute, I, I am not doing any gift. I'm doing my job in terms of redistribution of wealth. Totally different is the situation in philanthropy, where I have the money in my pockets, I give the money, and this is a gift. But if you compare the relationships, the two relation types of relationship in the welfare and in the philanthropy is totally different. Uh, my mother lived in a very small village in the Alps. She is 95. She is very active. And in the morning, sometime she wake up and go to the door, open the door in the morning because she, she loves uh, the sunrise. <laughs> and uh, she found um, a basket with fruit and vegetable, vegetable at the door. And she doesn't know who um, gave the, 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 the basket. And so she started to indicate, to find out who could be, could, could be the, the, the donor and uh, she phones the friends uh, and she discovers who is the donor. At the end, 
she, uh, after weeks, uh, she replay, she makes a, another gift to other people. And in the village, we have many people that are delivering gift uh, each other with the fruit of their garden. Their relationship created by the gift is very strong. It's, it's much stronger than the relationship uh, uh, created in the society by the politics. But do you think do you think the welfare system which you described there earlier? So your microphone is just bound by your lap. Oh, you just lift it up. Um, do you think that the uh, system created, uh, the welfare system built up, uh, especially after the Second World War, is sustainable uh, going forward at the level that it was? Are we, we going to see societies that will have to change uh, fundamentally uh, in Europe? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, we have to make it sustainable. We don't have to destroy the welfare system. Otherwise, we destroy the society. Do you want an example? Why don't you go? I, I was in, uh, in Mumbai and in Chennai uh, a month ago in the slums. It's the best example of uh, not having a welfare system. If you, don't, if, you do, if you do want a society without welfare system, go there to see how is the effect. No wealth, no sustainability, no uh, poor people, no, uh, no water, no drinkable water. If you want to buy drinkable water, and, and of course because you don't have drinkable water, you have poison water and you have a lot of illnesses. Uh, if you want drinkable water, you can buy the water in a, the plastic bottle delivered by Coca-Cola. Do you want like this system, this type of systems? Let, let, me, let me bring in, Marcus, you wanted to come in as well. Point on this. The question about how to sustain the, the social welfare state and the European model, I, I called it in my paper <laughs> yeah. also, I, I think we should really fight for that. Uh, and of course we are in, in a crisis moment, but I, I really thought about, and I travel also much around the world, and uh, of course it would be a nice debate now to have some Americans here. I think one of the good, uh, the good point of the crisis was that there is a debate again about which system we want to have here in Europe. In the 80s and in the 90s there was just a kind of idiotic believing that the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon model, uh, which is a, a weak state with strong economy, is the, the only leading and it's the, the end of history that we take that one. I think we, we have developed in Europe different kind of social welfare state models which really work. And, and if you look at, 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 at the best countries to live in the world, it's always the same. Under the first 20, there are 12 countries minimum from Europe, or 14 in, in one of the, the US magazines uh, one year ago it was. Mm -hmm. It is the Scandinavian model we should look, and it's different. It's, it's the German, it's the Polish, it's the French model, and different models are here. And, uh, and they are in, they, it's possible to innovate them, and th this is, I think, the point which foundations can play a role in that. How could we bring in with this little private money which, uh, money which we have into this kind of system? Because I'm also a parliamentarian in my town in, in Brandenburg and when I've learned how, how small is the room for innovation inside of a public administration because it's not in the DNA, yes, as it is in a, in a, in a corporate, in a company, or uh, as we can use it, or then, then I start to, to, to to think about if we push a little bit money in that, and we, uh, some examples we have heard, we start to be an intermediary between the different players, because between the corporates, between the civil society, between the public administration and academia and things like that, then we can have a very, very strong impact. But this is not coming from alone, that's something what I have learned. You need instrument for this kind of playing, a kind of political or pre-political role as a foundation. And in that way, I really believe on the European system, the welfare, if we innovate it all the time. And then I think it's just a create, the, the, in the global competition about system, I think it's then the question of which one creates and has most space for creativity. Yes? And that's the reason also that I'm not afraid for the state capitalism system which we have in Russia or China, because I think they will fail on that topic. I'm sure on that. I'm going to ask one more question here to, to Pierre Mario. Then I want to open up and get some views in from around the room. We have a conversation here. If you want to comment on how you think social welfare is changing, uh, the extent to which the context in which you as foundations or you as grantees uh, are operating is changing, please make sure you catch my eye. But let me put one more question to Pierre Mario, then I'm going to uh, take it up the floor. 
the, the point that Ingrid raised in her question was this loss of trust, she called it, between yeah. the public and private sector. And in this yeah. moment of crisis, uh, and we see this in countries throughout Europe, there's a sense of people maybe in the public sector that yeah. have and want to keep uh, the private sector being on the front line and workers in the private yes. sector perhaps being at the bottom of the pile, but perhaps on managements looking for cheaper solutions, work outside uh, yes. Europe or you know, outside the United States. How do we recover this trust? Do you think it was a fair question I, to raise? I completely agree with Ingrid because I have the impression that uh, from the political point of view, we have selected the worst pe people for, for that role. For in which role? In Europe. For, for, for in, which role? For which role? For, for the political okay. role. Eh? As politicians, we have chosen the worst person because we had two clowns, uh, Berlusconi <laughs> and uh, Sarkozy. And I don't see at the moment uh, any champion in politics uh, today in Europe. Uh, um, so, uh, I'm glad you're sticking to Europe here. We're not getting to other countries as well. You're no, in, in, selective Europe, with your in Europe, I don't <laughs> see a lot of uh, champion in politician. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, both economics and politician have really failed to achieve their task. May I show you some figures? Uh, I, I give you just an idea why I'm very uh, fed up about politicians and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and business and, and profit. It's coming, it's coming. I, it's coming? Yeah, it was up here a second ago, so I think it's going to come again. We have just a couple to of the give charts. You, yeah, just to go. give you an idea, an idea. This is referring to the Canada and the United States, but it can, we can generalize to uh, all the countries in Europe. Uh, here is the average real income of the top 1% of people. And you see that during the year, the 1% of the, of the people um, increased a lot their income. And if you see the same figures about uh, the share, they diminished the share in this, in this period between 1943, after the, 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 the war, till, till uh, uh, the late 80s. Eh? They diminished the share. Then started to achieve a higher share of the, in of the total income. So we have the 1% of the population is becoming richer and richer. And if you see this, to get to half of total income, you need almost 92% of the poorest or about 80% of the richest. So you have to collect 92% of the poorest to make half of the total income. And the bottom 50% of the population received 6.6% of the total income. The top 15% of the population received about 13% of total income. In this sense, six million top people receive as much as more than three billion poorest. The ratio is 500 to one. And why I don't trust financial and economic sector? Because uh, the, uh, despite the scandals and despite this situation, starting from 2007, the Wall Street and the city denied together, continue to deny to have rules. And the last scandal is, in this week, the manipulation of LIBOR, the interbank index. So they don't want to have rules because they want to continue to make money freely. We cannot have this type of partners. We need to change our way of thinking and our way of world. That's why I'm really upset and very convinced. I don't have, I said that I don't have many answer, uh, any answers, but I have only questions. Uh, well, <laughs> but I'm we may really get some, we may sure get some, about that. We may get some questions around the room. Are you coming in, Andreas, at this point? No, no, in a minute. Um, let's make sure we get some, I want to make sure I get some questions from the floor here and whether people sort of concur with uh, the outputs laid by, by, by both Pier Mario and also by Marcus. Um, whether there are any questions people want to come in right now, whether you believe that the world in which
foundations are operating are fundamentally changing. Governments are being incapable so far of preventing uh, a growth in this loss of trust between the public and private sectors um, and that in essence you're going to have to be operating in a very different environment, one in which potentially the welfare capacity of governments may be declining, um, but in which the private sector is not able to pick up uh, the difference. I mean, uh, is this a way that you would interpret it, Marcus? Because in Germany, that Gini coefficient line, if we were shown, I presume would have had quite a different spread. The point has been made that you, you gave an example of some of the Nordic countries, in particular in Europe, that seem to have hit a balance yeah. uh, between being able to uh, maintain welfare systems that are relatively well funded and yet have quite successful private sectors as well. Yeah. What, what so is the I, trick? Is this a public administration I, issue, I think a private there is issue? Um, I, I'm not so skeptical. From my background, I'm coming from Southwest Germany, and you're from. I think we have really a sector. We have a tradition, and uh, it's strengthened now of, of entrepreneurship and of, 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 of corporates, which are very much in Germany. You know that about the hidden champions, this yeah. Mittelstand, which is really strong, which are family-owned companies, which is really the heart of the German business. And there is another ethos. I really, and uh, you know it also perhaps from, from the Lombard day. This is a complete other ethos at that, what we have learned in the 80s and the 90s about what is successful business. This, look, at, look at companies like Bosch, where I have worked. This is, is completely owned by a foundation. They, they, they live since 130 years now, very successful all over the world. They had six bosses in 120 years. We had more popes in that time. Yeah? <laughs> so there is continuous, uh, continuity and, and there is a long-term thinking in this. And this is the background also of the success in the moment in, in Germany. And uh, this was also a lot of restructuring in the 90s and in the, in the beginning of 2000. If you look, and then you can change very quickly a society also. We had unemployment rates just five years before, which are not far away from that what the thousand uh, countries now have. Mr. Schroeder in 2006, when he made his really hard reforms, we had more than five million. Yes, we had areas in eastern, in eastern Germany where we had 25% unemployment. Now in this area, where I believe we have six, a little bit far away from, from Berlin, it's perhaps still 12. But you can change it. And, and so I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic uh, about, about also our public administration. I'm coming from Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria. And I think one of the success, besides of a fluent um, and really innovative kind of business, is really effective public administrations. Also, there is innovation possible. Yeah. So I'm a little bit more optimistic on that. And I noticed that you've had in, uh, as you said earlier in Germany, uh, a huge number of private foundations. Yes. So uh, how does this fit? Here we are in a society where you might argue there's maybe less need for foundations, and yet you have an enormous amount of them. What is this correlation right. uh, that, that's so, existed there? And here we are, been talking in Greece, you're comparing the numbers of foundations that operate in Greece where the correlation seems to be the inverse. So, so my, my, my point is always why, why I believe that the European model in this more northern way, where you have a welfare state, which is good, funded by taxes. But the point is, if then this private wealth is coming as, a, as an add-on, as an innovation driver, this is just a little bit money uh, into the game. And you have these 19,000, uh, they, they pay their taxes, they make successful businesses, and then they, it's called the cure. If you make this ice sky thing, mm -hmm. you have the flicht, the duty, and in the end there is coming the cure. You still mm -hmm. give more, and it's not just the money, you as a person, especially these medium-sized uh, entrepreneurs, which are rich people, they are millionaires, of course, if they mm -hmm. have uh, one generation of success. They are very strong, committed to their uh, local communities. They are the drivers of the civil society in their areas. And the, the most of that foundations are really regional, but the, the, they are a part of the game be, between local community, the business community, and the civil society. It's very local funded, yeah. and, uh, and that's perhaps one of the, the success stories about it. Yeah. Um, please, Pierre Mario, come in. And I'm looking around here to see if anyone wants to come in. Okay, there's one question at the front. Uh, Pierre Mario, do you want to go first? Um, yes, uh, I think that probably some countries uh, should avoid to have some best example around the world. They should try because, uh, because every country is, has its own history. So, um, and so you, in a family you have some time, if you have three or four or five kids, uh, you have some time a kid uh, uh, who can not play a good role in the school, has not a performance uh, as you want. Uh, 
uh, but the, the worst way is to present the best example of no, the brother. Huh? Uh, because I am a bit skeptical about also uh, about Berlin, because I think that uh, Germany invested a lot of money in Berlin, and Berlin is sexy, but probably is not so poor. So if you want to change uh, Greek, if you want to change Greek, uh, you have to start uh, from the Greek potentiality. And it takes time, it, ta it takes decades, because you have a beautiful, a beautiful country, you have a beautiful culture, but pay attention, I'm not talking about the culture of Platon, Aristotle and Socrates, I'm talking about the last literature. The, the literature of the last century, the Greek literature, is one of the best in the world. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, Gyanirizos, Seferis, and the, the, the most uh, valuable authors. So, they have a lot of potentiality. They have to start from their potentiality. They need to base their economy not only on tourism, but also in industry. So they have to decide which type of industry uh, to develop in the future. And probably they need some help from Europe in doing that. It will take decades, but we will have at the end a sort of balance from the economy point of view and also in the society. But Europe has to help. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Andreas, you will come. Yeah. Just some, uh, some general comments. And we hear uh, a lot about either or. We hear about it's either growth or austerity. And I think it's getting a bit tiring for, for, for all of us. We have to, to learn. We have to compromise. There has to be growth and austerity. You talk about you know, the Anglo-Saxon model is like doesn't work. You know, so the European welfare state works. I don't agree with that. I think they, there's a good mix. There are things to learn from the Anglo-Saxon and, the, and there are things to learn and that really work from the, from the European uh, social welfare state, which though at this point it's, you know, it, it's going through a tough, a tough time. And I think it's unfair to say it's either you have the social welfare state or you end up like the Indian slums. I think we have to be careful with this. We go too much to the extremes and, and we always say from both sides, from all, from all sides, you know, it's either or. And I think the time has come where we all have to, to get together, not in a philosophical, you know, let's all sing together, but I mean, to get together, take all the positives from the different models, the different cultures, and, and, and try to find the right mix. And, uh, you know, when Friedman talks about a flat world, that means that comes with a lot of baggage on it. And we have to find the right mix. And uh, I think that comes through, through basic collaborations and through basic compromises to eventually end up to what I spoke about in the morning yesterday about the social welfare society. And I think even, even using the word social welfare state carries a lot of negative baggage on it because it implies it's state, it implies it's on the left. I mean, it, you know, we have to move on. And I think a, a, a social welfare society implies and brings in a lot of the positives. It needs a, a strong state. It needs the, a positive role from, from things like the foundations. Because as we said, the foundations cannot replace the state. They can add value, they can come in, fill the holes, uh, do other things. But all these will contribute to establishing a social welfare society. And I think we have to move on in this new century to this uh, concept of the you know, social welfare so society. Thanks. Thank you. And a comment there at the back as well. Uh, Yes, uh, I heard consciously what uh, the stable uh, has uh, said, uh, and uh, my sentiments are with Mr. Hips, Mr. Hip, who says that we have to change everything. We are not very happy with the world that we are living but there is a principle which is common in physics, in sociology, and in psychiatrics. And this is resistance to change. <laughs> there are many countries that they are more easy to change than the others. And Germany is maybe one of the first in this thing. 
you faced many changes in the last century, and we hope that we will not face many others in the years to come. Coming to my country, in order to make the changes that I want, hmm, I want it deeply, I have to, ma to make a revolution. I'm not Spartacus. I'm not Napoleon the Great. I'm not, you know, many of these people. So I have to be a little bit conscious. So I have to say that my friend, uh, Mr. Velo, expressed a little bit better what we should do. Although my heart and my arms are with you, Mr. Hip. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, question at the back there as well, please. Yep. Or comment. My, Go ahead. Yep. My name is Dimitris Gramatikogiannis. I'm born and bred Greek. Uh, now in the Greek parliament, we have a party, the fascist party, the Golden Dawn. And uh, we speak about the role of audacious. And I would like to ask, because there are representatives from the Greek church, uh, a lot of representatives of, of all the foundations of the Greek uh, country, and I would ask now, what are we doing from, for this problem? Because they <laughs> speak for violence against immigrants, and we all speak here about how we can help them. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've got three... Sort of Here, my, Mario Bello, you are absolutely right because it's an ethical crisis and secondly, a financial problem. Thank you. Um, ethical crisis and financial. The point that was just made there, because a couple of folks didn't hear it, he said that in Greece there has been a rise and in this current sort of crisis of extremist parties, he mentioned in particular the Golden Dawn, the fascist party has now got seats in the, the Greek parliament, correct? Yes. Um, and... Uh, so what are foundations doing about this? I know there are some foundations, uh, we've got the Open Society Foundation, I think here you've got uh, Mercator, others in Germany, that actually run some quite active programs on trying to understand better the, the genesis of, 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 of this growing extremism. But you may want to make a comment on that. And I think it'd be good to get also back to the comment uh, Andres made about the rise of can we find a social welfare society as opposed to a social welfare state that somehow marries together the best of the different models? Is it really an either-or situation or not? Um, do you want to come in f on either of those points first, Marcus? <coughs> I take perhaps first the, 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 the extremists. Yeah. We had these phenomenons also in, 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 in Eastern Germany, very strong, but in other parts also. And the only way I think in that field is really that you have to, to f also as a foundation together with the communities, to have alternatives. We have some uh, parts in Eastern Germany where they are very, very smart. Uh, we have some right parties and they, they are not so um, aggressive as they were looking 20 years or in the really fascistic times. But they, they learned their lessons, the, the, the really the fascists, yep. and they do it in this kind of, they, they, they use our words sometimes. They use civil society and they go from door to door and they offer the people uh, just a, a kind of participation. So this is really a competition about well, who offers the better parts of, of participation for the, for the young people. It's specific, a, a problem in our areas, in some parts of Eastern Germany, where we have left a lot of young, unequal, uh, un, un, um, unqualified young men, because the, the women, the most, left. It's amazing. Qualified women left earlier. Yeah, they look around if they don't find a man to marry where they can equally look. If they look down, they never marry, so they leave. That, that's, that's sociology. We have really studies about that. And what's left in, in villages where there is no future are unqualified men. And this is the, the, the huge danger in some areas. And all what you can do is... Uh, Either you find a more qualified Greek or Spanish people to bring there, or you have to make other offers uh, for participation. There's, yeah. there's been some research just on that point as well, done that we were involved in um, at Chatham House on the rise of populist parties. It is fascinating the extent to which, as you said, these groups have come in many cases and offering social services yes. of the sorts that I've heard foundations here yes. uh, look to are also competing look to, to provide. Look to Hungary in the moment, yeah. yeah. Um, but the other thing that's happened is the major political parties are no yeah. longer working as much at a retail level. They are, in many cases, have gone at a national level, fighting over marginal seats, and leave many parts of the country and abandon them 
to right. uh, the strength but of these particular parties. Let me make one point, which is necessary because you raised it point of parties. I'm also in a party in Germany, and it's really a, it's a huge challenge to attract qualified young people from different sectors to join the parties. And I still believe this is very, very necessary. You need new leaders, and not just radicalists and populists, but smart leaders, which also joining parties. We will have a future in which parties still make the game. No. And uh, it's really also a trouble if you look at the Christian Democrats or Social Democrats. All are shrinking also in Germany to have, uh, and they are still in power in all the uh, Pima, did you want to come in and be good? Uh, this issue of the social uh, market society as well, and is it really a, uh, the either-or that you seem to describe in your presentation here? Mm, yes, I think that um, uh, I have some suggestion and our experience in Italy, for example. Uh, the suggestion is, uh, in comparison with the political field and the political <laughs> actors, uh, Probably philanthropy can play a very strong role and very qualitative role, high quality, qualitative role. Uh, of course, you have many uh, foundation in Greek and, uh, and a very, very um, skillful foundation. Probably if you put together the forces and if you have a very strong association capable to speak and to in, to dialogue with the, with the politicians, uh, that could be nice. Uh, that could be a very, very good. For example, in Spain uh, or uh, in Italy, uh, I give you the example of Italy, we have 88 uh, banking foundation. Of course, uh, the association of banking foundation is, is very strong, very, really very strong. Um, and um, the government is taking care of what, what philanthropy is doing, of course. And sometimes we are running some project uh, as an example, a pioneer example. Right. And then sometimes some of these projects are passing into the hands of politicians. Uh, but you have to involve at the very early phase, at the very beginning, you cannot arrive uh, with an example of project uh, and say that politicians or the government, this is the way, please do that. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not, it doesn't work. Uh, it works if you take them on board at the beginning. Okay. I, I, I would like to underline this for Germany. This culture of cooperation is something which also just arised the last 10 years. In the 90s, each foundation wanted to make its nice project and wanted to do the better. It was a lot of Oh, I'm the, I'm the most beautiful and the best, and it was not. Now we have really an, a change of culture, really to cooperate. The first step was inside of the foundations, and now it's more and more to partner really with all around you. Yes, and we learn much from that. And I have, I give you just a figure uh, why we should separate the roles and, uh, and our task. We have calculated that if we put together all the endowments of the banking foundation and we want to finance uh, the, uh, the uh, public expenditure for health, uh, our endowments uh, will dower till the 6th of January. <laughs> so, despite the fact that we are relative rich as banking foundation, yeah. Uh, our endowments and our power is not sufficient uh, to solve the public problems. Yeah, no, I think so, this point of uh, foundations as acupuncturists and so on was, was very well made, I think, on that first day. Luke. Uh, yeah, uh, Luke Tyer, Kim Goldman Foundation. I just want to uh, bring it back to what foundations can do. You speak about fascist parties or populist parties. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things, anyhow, we see is that democracy, it has to do with trust, it has to do with ethos, is a challenge in our societies and so we cannot run away from it. But one of the, our lessons is anyhow that what you never should do is attack the enemy directly. So you don't go against the fascist party because then you make them stronger. Um, we did, we, just three examples. One thing we did was to make very thorough research, we financed research of universities to study those parties and we did it in a submarine way, nobody knew, the media didn't know, and we gave those studies to the study services of the different other democratic parties. So we did that for them, they got it, nobody knew, nobody should have known, now you know, but you will keep <laughs> quiet about it. 
Um, second, we have a program which is running for years uh, is on democracy uh, with ch children and schools. I mean, you need to start up every, every day to let people understand that democracy is not about ha having the right, I'm right, you're wrong, it's consensus, and consensus is not negative. It's one of the problems of the media is that when you have a compromise, it's seen as a negative thing. It's a positive thing. So we work with young children, and, and we have more than 300 schools coming in our museum doing those things. But also our board now for the future has said, we do sometimes prospective studies with all the stakeholders. And one of the issues they want us to work on the next three years is really the future of democracy and how, what are the elements with the social media, how can we work on it. And lastly, I think, towards the civil society organizations and extreme right parties, is the problem is that the extreme right parties always link in to things where normal people get nervous about, and it's not the critics on the normal people. For example, migrants. Now, a lot of the, of the NGOs who work on migrant communities, they have the talents to make the people go the wrong way because they speak to the converted. They preach to the people who are already converted, which means that the people who are in the middle go to the wrong side. So what we did, and it took us a year to convince the NGOs, is to give them a training in framing and reframing their messages in a way that, it, that the people go to the right direction. So I'm just giving that as an illustration that first lessons learned surely never attack as a foundation or an NGO directly the fascist or the, I don't think it works. But there are other ways and we have a big responsibility also being part of a democracy to work on those issues. Let me, I see there's a question, lady there, if you take the microphone there please. Uh, and a question at the back as well, sorry, is that, yeah? Okay, and we'll do one at the back. We're coming close, I think we've got to be finished certainly by 10 past one, and we are running a bit over time, but yeah, I want to make sure we have a chance to come back. Please. Hello, yeah, my name's Jenny Clark. I've worked for a number of um, NGOs, mainly in the UK, and I just wanted to come back to the uh, question of the role of foundations in building trust in society, uh, which I know the issue of trust is a, a really big concern here at the moment, uh, but it also has been in the UK. There's been a lot of concern about um, a lack of social cohesion in the UK and, and some research done into that that found actually the highest levels of trust tended to be at a very local level. So amongst local communities at a grassroots level, uh, there are still reasonably good levels of, of, of trust. Um, and that seemed to touch with what Mr. Hip was saying uh, about the situation in Germany where local foundations and local companies can work very well together and have got a very solid base of trust in local communities. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, I'm aware in the UK there is a network of um, local level uh, foundations that work at community level. I think it's called the Community Foundation Network and I know that they do really important work uh, funding grassroots projects um, at a local level and perhaps that's, that model is something to, to consider and perhaps it could help address the, the lack of trust here. So I just wanted to raise that. That's a very interesting point. I think this working really down rather than up, you know, less of a top-down answer, much more of a local answer. I'll let you come back to this with some closing comments in a minute. There's a lady in the middle, I think, right back. Yes, you have a microphone. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Joanna. I'm uh, working with uh, Praxis, and it's more a question about understanding how it works uh, with uh, foundations and possibilities of co-funding projects that are across borders and not just within the same... Uh, uh, country and also I think it's a, a great opportunity having not only foundations but grantees as well to somehow grasp the opportunity and keep up on sharing experience and beyond the limits of this uh, room or finding ways to go on uh, sharing what we know and learning out of uh, from uh, our uh, good parts and negative parts not uh, just among foundations, but also among us grantees as well. Great, so that, exactly, uh, I think another reason why this has been a great meeting to hold, because you've, you've pulled these two, two groups together um, at this session today. I don't see any other hands going up at the moment. I know we're close to lunch. Let, let me come back, uh, Pimario, let me come to you first. Do you want to make any comments uh, on, on, there are a number of good points made, yeah. but as well this, this, I think this point about how, whether in today's world, tackling a lack of of, of, or a loss of trust, 
which is tied in somewhat with a, a loss of social cohesion, mm. is something that really does need to be done more at the local level. We've gone through a mm. period, governmentally, of very much top-down, uh, and the top-down model perhaps mm. being the most uh, explicit model of the mm. second half of the 20th century. We're moving maybe in, in terms of our response yes. to something that's different at a different scale. Yes, I told you that I am very critical against uh, politicians and uh, uh, economics, but I have to say that if we, if we want to to effort this, uh, this uh, task, uh, trust in society, we have absolutely to cooperate and collaborate uh, with the public uh, bodies. And uh, for example, I give you an example that we have done um, uh, about social housing, just because we talk about social housing and we saw this beautiful example. Uh, we decided, because after the Second World in Italy there was a lot of social housing because people were poor. And then after the 80s, they stopped immediately, they stopped suddenly to, to, to build the social housing. And nowadays we have a, a need for social housing. Uh, so we uh, created a foundation, social housing foundation. We uh, created a fund. <laughs> And then we developed uh, uh, many projects uh, located in Lombardy on social houses. Uh, but of, because of the, of the fact that these approach were winning, uh, we involved the central government and we transformed the project in a nationwide project. And so we merge our fund with the government uh, fund in order to, to have a mass a capacity. Uh, so this is an example how to involve the government uh, in, in um, some specific uh, philanthropic uh, project. And the second example about uh, society, a trust in society, uh, we have created 15 uh, community foundations. So it means uh, independent foundation located in the region and, uh, and involving the society, the local society, for philanthropy. I think it's a way, it's a difficult job. Eh? It's not easy, it's not so easy. Uh, but uh, it's a way of sensibilizing the society for philanthropy. Uh, about um, uh, cross-border, and knowledge and learning and so on. I think that uh, the, um, with some difference with other foundations that uh, generally uh, grant directly to individuals, so we are not allowed by law to grant to individuals. We have to grant uh, to the NGOs, uh, to the organizations. So one mission, uh, one of our missions is to build the knowledge and the capacity of the organization operating in philanthropy. And so we created a community of practice because they need, they ask for learning, they ask for sharing knowledge, they ask for debating the results, also the failures. And so we uh, play a very big role as catalysts and as uh, uh, an entity who can propose uh, some tentative, some innovation experiments and so on. But, but it's really important that you have as a partners the economies and the politicians. Thank you, Marcos. Last yeah, point. Per my, my last point is to do all that what we talk about, this is our what we try as BMW Foundation, that is also my personal experience. For doing that, you need much more well-educated people and some leaders which really <laughs> knows how the different logics of sectors work. You know, we, it's, it sounds so easy, but look at our societies. You study something and you go in one field. Either you make a business career or you go to public administration, you go to university or academia, you make your business, or you make a, an NGO, and this is your world, and normally, 95% in Europe, this is a big difference to the US, and that's one point that the US is much more open uh, on that and more innovative. 
you don't have really much cross-sectoral careers. You don't have mm. much areas in which you can cross-sectoral competencies. It does not work from alone. We made a real hard experience. Let's talk about failures. When I took over the BMW Foundation, I came from the NGO world and I said, oh, why should I work with this elitarian group of, of really people who made it? Really business leaders, owners of companies, really high ranked people between 30 and 45 from the business field. And I thought, wow, this is not a good way. But then I, I remembered as an NGO, go, I always wanted to touch these people, yes, for my uh, NGOs and my social enterprises. And then I said, how bring them together and, and really start something new. The beginning was a catastrophe. We invited some NGOs and social enterprises and we invited and we had our BMW uh, people with, uh, yeah, completely different, not attached to social things. And it was first a clash of cliches, which you could follow, yes. They were the, 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 the business people were sitting there, they, these people are not possible to pitch their stuff in three minutes, look at their clothes, and the NGO guys, they're sitting, they're coming just here for getting a cheap BMW. And that was, <laughs> this was the kind of cliches you see. So what we have learned really to develop instruments to, to, to create situation in which you can, you, you leave your roles and your cliches and you start to look at the person and you start to understand what is the logic of why he is acting like that and what could he bring into the game. It's a really personal leadership training which we need much more and that's something perhaps we, we could develop in some societies. Do you really know how a public administration works from inside? What are the possibilities and what are the limits? Do you really know what is the limit of an NGO and what is the possibility? Do you really know what drives an entrepreneur and what not? And to fit that together you need much, much more leadership skills in a, in a broad base of people uh, which make also cross-sectoral careers. I had the luck because I have a ca chaotic career. I want to get a priest and then I had to change <laughs> a little bit because I met my wife. So this is, this is a reason that changed your life. So change is not the dangerous for me. I always had to jump in the sectors and it was just interesting for me to see they, they all want to do most of them. I'm, I'm still an optimist. <laughs> the most of the people, they want to do their job good. Yeah. But it's just a, a lack of opportunities to, to, to go in cooperation. Well, thank you for those points. It's been, a, it's been a great discussion, been a very different type of discussion to the one we've had so far, which is focused really on specific answers that foundations can provide. And we've looked much more at the context in which they're having to operate. I and mean, I take away, I suppose, two quick points. Um, we're in a time of crisis, but I think this, the context of crisis will continue. Um, we're going to be under pressure changes in the world are going to make sure that we'll be under pressure in Europe, in the United States, in the West in particular as a whole. And I just don't think governments are going to be able to come up with big answers. The top-down solutions, I know you're bemoaning the quality of political leadership, I just think the times cannot create it at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore the top-down answers are unlikely to be satisfying. And therefore this is where I think foundations and companies and, and entrepreneurship and innovation really have to come together to provide the answers and a lot of it will be done at the local levels. This, this, there will not be national answers necessarily. There will have to be answers that are local and I think a word that maybe we've used a bit in these last few days about resilience. The capacity to build resilient communities, resilient societies, resilient individuals um, uh, and where it's not an either or solution you end up with a kind of the social market uh, society or the social welfare society uh, that's been described at this conference may be part of the answer. But I think we're going to have to start at the level where foundations play. Mm -hmm. It's going to be increasingly important and the NGOs that they support. May, may I connect your intervention with the intervention about the res resistance uh, yeah. against the change? Uh, uh, I find that uh, probably there are two approaches that can facilitate the change. One is the exchange of experience. So if you have a network uh, where people can meet together and, uh, and, uh, and ex uh, exchange their experience and failures, uh, this is very positive. It's a learning approach. And the second way of um, overcoming the resistance is doing things together because it's time to do partnerships, uh, not if two or three foundations are doing the same thing mm -hmm. in their area. Why don't they put together the brains and the, and the thinking and, and the efforts in order to, to stimulate new, new ideas? So the partnerships, we don't have to do things alone in our courtyard. 
Well, I think we can thank the Stavros Niakos Foundation for pulling us together because yes. I think these two days are about building partnerships, yes. uh, both amongst grantors, with grantees. Um, it's a great opportunity. Thank you for two very stimulating, passionate sets of comments. Thank you for some very good questions. And I think it's lunch. It's lunch and we meet again at 2 o'clock. Meet again at 2 o'clock and lunch is where it was. Okay. Exactly. But thank you very much for your time. Thank here you. Today. Thank thank you. you. Thank you.